Hi, and welcome to this second installment of our VF Singwell panel discussion, uh, focusing on how music uh, can and should remain a priority for schools during these challenging times. Uh, my name is Jennifer Coleman Pears, and I'm the Interim Chief Exec of the Voices Foundation, and it's my real pleasure to be hosting the discussion today. The Voices Foundation is a charity that works alongside teachers and school communities to transform music education, supporting children's wider skill development and well-being through accessible singing programmes. We provide continuing professional development and well-being uh, learning for educators, inspiring content for parents and in-depth research and evaluation. We believe that together we can ensure every child is able to find their voice through the power of singing. So before we get started, uh, just a few housekeeping points. Um, we are recording this session, so we'll be posting it on YouTube um, after. Uh, so if you want to watch back or if anyone of uh, your colleagues is unable to join us, they'll be able to, to watch that back. Um, but don't worry, all attendees are muted and your videos are switched off, so you won't be making an appearance. Um, you can just kick back and enjoy the session. Uh, we're going to be live tweeting through the session. Um, my colleague will be uh, posting out all the, the top quotes from, from the discussion uh, using the hashtag BFSingWell. Uh, so do join in the conversation on, online as well. We're going to run the discussion for around uh, 30 or 40 minutes uh, and then we'll open up to your attendee questions. So um, if you have a, a question you'd like to ask, just open up the, the Q&A um, panel, uh, which you'll find at the bottom of your navigation. Uh, type your question in there. Um, and my colleague Katie is uh, behind the scenes uh, working to, to triage those questions um, and make sure that the, the, the key ones get uh, put to the panel at the end. Um, and finally, <laughs> the, the, with, as always with the, these things, um, it potentially could be technical problems. Um, uh, the internet uh, is a wonderful thing, but can sometimes be challenging. So forgive us for any technical glitches along the way. Um, my colleague Deborah is, is primed behind the scenes to step in should my broadband fail. Um, fingers crossed that won't be necessary, but uh, always good to have a backup plan. Um, so we've actually got three, three fantastic panellists who are joining us today, so hopefully they can all switch their videos um, back on uh, now so you can see them. There we go. Um, so uh, I'll just give you some, some quick introductions and you can see the fantastic brains that we've got to pick uh, today. Um, so first, uh, Dr Anita Collins. So Anita is an award-winning educator, researcher and author in the field of brain development and music learning. She's internationally recognised for her unique work in translating the science, uh, scientific research of neuroscientists and psychologists uh, for the everyday parent, teacher and student. In her newly published work, The Music Advantage, Anita draws on the latest international neurological research to reveal the extraordinary and surprising benefits of children learning music. Thanks so much for joining us today, Anita. Um, she's actually joining from Australia, so uh, <laughs> they're great. So we've got a proper, proper international panel for you today. Uh, second, we've got Gary, uh, Gary Griffiths, um, who's the author of Music Unlocked, which is Music Mark's COVID-19 guidelines for the music education sector, which certainly at the Voices Foundation we have found invaluable. Um, he was the lead for Havering Music Education Hub in East London for over seven years and managed peripatetic tuition in Essex for 13 years before that. Gary now supports music education hubs with Music Mark and performs as a mostly classical baritone in normal times. <laughs> Welcome, Gary. Thanks for joining us. Um, and then last but not least, Sophie. Sophie Gosden um, has been the head teacher at the Mill Primary Academy in Crawley, West Sussex, uh, since January 2018. New to working with the Voices Foundation this academic year, the Mill Primary Academy has fully embraced the commitment to music making as it is inclusive, celebratory, builds a sense of community and engages parents and carers. They aim to provide a stimulating and vibrant learning community, constantly improving and providing children with experience that develops perseverance, ambition and optimism. Their whole school vision is encapsulated in the phrase forever proud. It's a lovely sentiment. So thanks, thanks for joining us, Sophie. So as you can see, we've got three great brains to, to, to pick for you today, and um, each bringing a slightly different perspective on that question of, um, you know, why, why should we make music um, during these difficult times and how can we do that in a, in a way that is safe and, and engaging for children? So we'll just kind of kick off with, with the first question, which um, I guess, you know, maybe a, a slightly kind of provocative question, but, but why sing? You know, why, why, why does singing matter? Um, and I guess it would be just great to kind of hear um, each of your kind of personal takes on, on why singing matters to you. Um, and Gary, I might come to you first as the, as the baritone amongst us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it was lovely to be with you all this morning. Um, why sing? Well, why not sing? Um, I think it's, it's so innate in all of us, uh, and I've seen it so many times that actually if you introduce singing in an environment where it hasn't been uh, embedded before, actually it brings everyone together. Uh, it, it really does contribute to that health and well-being uh, agenda. Everybody feels better for singing. Um, and uh, I think in the winter as well, it's great. I always get warm when I sing as well. So it's, uh, it's sort of my own personal sort of little uh, heater um, but it is it's just so personally uplifting so rewarding um, I think there's a there's a statistic uh, that we have more choirs in the UK than chip shops uh, I'm not sure if that's entirely robust um, but I think it probably would be the right way around 
Um, as a lifelong singer, I just can't imagine being without it. Amazing, thank you. Um, Sophie, how about you? What, what, why is singing important to you? <laughs> Well, um, I kind of made some. I've made some notes of just some of the points I want to talk about today. And one of the things that I wrote was music is in our DNA as humans, and I think that children show you that best because they haven't learnt any of the um, perhaps the self consciousness that we have as adults. So when I first joined the school, one of the things that really surprised me was um, when we brought singing into assemblies the fact that they were just wiggling and moving and just enjoying themselves and it was just so uplifting and I thought gosh why aren't we doing more of this and it had I mean I'm sure we'll talk about this more later on in the conversation but the, the knock-on impact in terms of behavior calm choices friendships confidence and on and on it goes all from singing together um, and it's just, as I say, it's part of not only our own DNA, but you know, it's part of, I think, what makes an effective school's DNA really, is that celebration and that, and, and that development of that skill. Amazing. And, and Anita, how about for you, what, what, singing, of all the kinds of the, the music making, what, what, why is singing important to you? Uh, I think through the research, for me, what I found was that actually singing is our first language and always has been. So it's the first language that babies understand our voices to be. So they hear our voices as if they're song rather than language. They don't yet understand what that is and they don't understand it for quite some time. Um, we now understand what happens when we sing together. And a lot of um, evolutionary psychologists have talked about the fact that it's such an important thing, but from the neuroscience side, we now know that when we sing together, our heartbeats will actually synchronize and our body temperatures, temperatures will synchronize to it as well, which is why we get that feeling of togetherness that is so immediate and so together and goes across, as you said, Sophie, to all the other behaviors in the, in the yeah. playground, yeah. Um, how kids are making choices and, and all sorts of things. So, but it's very physiological and neurological in terms of the fact that it's our oldest communication stream it's the one that we go back to if we're injured. Um, it's, the, it's the one that we go back to when we're older. Um, it's so innate and so close to us as being human beings that that's why it's such an important thing to do. And what we see in young children is exactly that, is that they've got very close access to their original language, which was song. And as they get older, they kind of separate the two out a little bit. But it's such an important thing to keep going, not just for children, but actually all the way through our lives because it, it creates that connectivity that we need, that social cohesion, and no more do we need it than we do in this quite horrendous year. So no. that's why, for me, singing, singing can be this incredibly powerful thing to bring our, our kids back together and back into the, the frame of mind they need for learning um, after having so much disruption that we don't know what the long-term effects are going to be. So, so interesting. I think um, so great to get the different takes. I think you know, we'll kind of talk about kind of music more kind of in the round, I guess. And for, for the Voices Foundation, the reason that singing is, is a priority for us is that it's accessible and universal. So, um, you know, almost everyone has a voice. Um, there are no kind of barriers to entry. You don't have to, you know, there's no expensive equipment or instruments that you need. Um, so, you know, for us as a charity, focusing on, on singing um, means that, you know, everyone everywhere, every child everywhere can engage with um, with music making um, in this in this really kind of, as you say, this kind of very natural and kind of an immediate way. So there's a, there's a real kind of power in, in that. Um, so I guess now, now turning to sort of that, that kind of music making kind of more generally, it needs to be great just to kind of um, hear a little bit more of the research around um, the benefits of, of to children and um, both in terms of their development and their well-being for um, engaging in, in singing and, and music making. Um, yeah, it's always hard when I get that question. It's like, where do we start? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think what we're learning from the research, and I'm I'm a music educator, so what I was first fascinated by was how this could make me and help me be a better teacher. But I actually find it's helping me understand human development all the way through our lives far more than anything else. Um, I think, as I said, song is our first language. It was the first way we communicated as humans, but then we're starting to understand that uh, children use song and their music processing when it comes to melody and rhythm to actually understand language in the first three years of their lives. And then they're flipping that around and using it to actually practice how to speak and how to make sounds, which is where there's that really magical point with toddlers where they have this sing-songy speech, which is halfway between song and speech. And you can it's like the moment you can see the music processing working to help them learn how to speak. 
uh, as they get older it help, and when they're sort of five, six, seven, it helps them to um, really cement the ability to read because they can hear the sounds as if it's music in their heads first and then they translate that into reading. It then switches over to much more of a social cohesion and a self a felt, uh, feeling of belonging um, that comes from singing together, which is why it's so important. And particularly as they go into puberty, it then starts to be about the nuance in speech and sound. And then it keeps going and going, there's just so many parts to it. So the benefits are huge, but they're also forever changing. There's not one answer. It's like, how old are the children? Where are they at in their development? And how is the processing of rhythm and melody enhancing different parts of their brain and that, that transfers to different parts of their body, as well as knowing themselves and their own identity. And almost, I, I, one of the researchers once said to me, that ability to actually be heard in all sorts of different ways is actually one of the most important things about singing. Mm -hmm. uh, for children so there's huge benefits I could go give me two days and I could explain them all but um, yeah there's enormous benefits to it and it's it keeps varying and keeps changing through life. Fascinating and I, I, I saw some, uh, an animation of, of some of the kind of work you've been looking at that was um, actually looking at the kind of almost like the fireworks that go off in, in uh, yeah. people's brains when they're engaging in music could you maybe say a little bit about about that? Yeah, so the, the scientists have almost by accident, as all great science things are, uh, they found out that music listening, first of all, and then music making um, set off more parts of the brain at once than any other activity that they've ever found. And they've been looking really hard. And it's um, both automated activity, meaning things that we don't even know that it's going on, as well as that conscious logical thought that's going on as well. But it's incredibly complex. If we think about singing in a group, we're thinking about, we're well, hearing and processing the sound we hear in a moment, but we're also processing it in relation to what's come before and what's coming after. So it's it's almost three dimensional in the way that we have to process everything. And it's done without us even knowing, which is the more amazing thing. And it activates more parts of the brain at the same time, but more of them have to, they have to be synchronized, they have to be consistent, um, they have to, and they have to be incredibly flexible. So that's why um, musically trained kids tend to perform better academically and balance more things, have a better emotional control because they've kind of figured out how to exercise all of their brain at once. So when they have to select little bits to use, it's not nearly as hard. Mm -hmm. I find that so fascinating. There's a, um, I can't, I'm not gonna be able to remember the exact statistic now, but there's there some research looking at um, Nobel Prize winning scientists um, and yeah. whether there any kind of analysis. And I, I, was it something like the, third, the, the Nobel Prize winning scientists versus you know, non-prize winning scientists were 30 times more likely to be in a choir um, or yeah. something of that magnitude. And I just found that staggering that you, you can have, you know, the, 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 and it, there's that kind of question at the, the time of whether was that kind of, you know, causal or you know, did that just you know, is that correlatory? But actually, you know, from the research that you've, you've you've kind of been describing, actually there is something kind of in it about you know, how how people's brains are actually wired, how they're kind of developing those abilities, yeah. um, which indicates yeah. that probably there is something kind of causal in that, which is just absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and a huge number of people, whether they be business people, science people, entrepreneurs, they can speak to how music learning has helped them think in a particular kind of way that they've then transferred or applied mm -hmm. to something else. And in this world where we, we think about, I know in Australia, we have a statistic that our, our kids will have 15 different jobs, not just one, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, maybe three or four different careers. That ability to be flexible and to change and to, to go in different directions is even more important now than it ever has been. So, yeah, it's both sides. It is genetic and it is a part of personality, but it's also um, it gets affected by experience. So I like to say it's nature and nurture. Mm -hmm. Both come together. Fascinating. And, and Sophie, from you kind of mentioned it a little bit in your kind of introduction, but in terms of the, the, the benefits, both development and well-being, um, could you maybe say a little bit more from your experience of, of working in school of how you've seen the, those benefits manifest? Yeah, I think um, if, we're, if we're completely honest about kind of the world we're living in now, you know, nothing to do with COVID, um, the educational system is very, 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 very focused on reading, writing, and mathematics and, and academic rigor. And um, as head, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. However, there has to be more. As a human, you are more than just a reader, a writer, and a mathematician. And if we're not finding ways to offer that to our children, and you know, 
uh, we're all artists we're all musicians you know um, we're all explorers and it's our job in in education to make sure that we are putting something out there for those that don't perhaps have something naturally coming to them well let's be the nurturer as Anita was saying our schools offering something to enable to nurture um, music endeavor from the children or are we looking out for those particular children that might have a talent in something that isn't assessed through an examination that you might sit at the end of a year you know um, and it's about I think as educators holding on to the wider perspective of what it means to be an educator and a provider for the children I'm not sure if that completely answers your question no, absolutely. So, yeah, you, you're right. It's about the whole whole person, isn't it? Whole whole child, and not just sort of seeing them as little kind of robots that are going to, um, you know, in, with inputs and outputs, but actually thinking about the kind of the, the, the broader development. Um, Gary, Gary, what's what's your kind of take on that question? You know, how, how have you seen through your work, particularly with music education hubs and the kind of work in the sector? How have you seen the kind of benefits for children kind of manifest? Uh, uh, definitely, um, the um, one of the projects that we were involved with when I was in Havering and actually is still ongoing was a project with the Wigmore Hall Learning Trust, uh, which really looked at embedding creative learning, not just music, but creative learning right across the curriculum. And um, we've always known that there's huge connectivity right, uh, right the way from, from across the curriculum for music. But this project really demonstrated that. And uh, in my time, we, we, we did it in two schools. Uh, and we had teachers who were the, what we called the arm folders, the people who turn up at CPD like that, um, would embrace music and would start to use it. And one school had a board with post-it notes on where they just uh, shared all the different ways that they'd used music in different subjects. So if somebody was struggling, they could go along and look, find a post-it note, ah, oh, yes, that's an idea that I can use. And the difference that that was making to the children uh, and to them, personally as well as academically. The other thing that was really interesting um, and something that I've noticed in my own life is that you've got that connectivity across the curriculum but it's also personal connectivity. Actually when you're making music you can create friendships with people who are very different to you, different age, different background. Um, it, it's a real leveller and actually again within these school uh, projects we saw that because we were able actually to connect with parents parents were coming in for, for singing sessions initially a bit reluctantly and you get a, 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 you know, a, a bright young music leader from the Wigmore Hall getting them to stand up and do all sorts of funny things that they never usually do and, and again you get not quite the arm folders but you can see people visibly uncomfortable and that falls away from them so quickly I think there's this this need within us uh, to, to make those connections with people and I think music is so powerful in doing that which is why when when Anita was talking all the time you can think oh yes I remember that happening in in, in that school I remember that happening in my own life I can I've seen that happen with with teachers the way, we, the way we've trained them mm. it's, uh, it's fascinating it's so interesting now, just picking up on, on what you were saying Sophie about the fact that um you know that not just in the current climate but it, the education system generally has sort of moved its focus more towards the kind of stem subjects there's been a real kind of push um, and a drive for that over the past sort of you know five to ten years um i, I guess we, we, you know we're not in no normal circumstances at the moment there's been this kind of huge you know gap in education this year you know ongoing ongoing disruption um and so a lot of the discussion around um the need for kind of catch-up curriculum to sort of you know regain ground lost in those kind of you know core subjects as they're referred to um so i you know i guess just you know, You've, you've all kind of you know made a very strong case for, for, for how music benefits um, children and, and actually all of us. Um, but you know, with all of the pressures that you know, the schools are under right now, um, why should we be prioritising music edu education right now? Can it not wait? Um, there's you know, there's all those other things that we need to kind of you know get, get back on top of. Um, you know, why should you know for, the, for those teachers who kind of joined us today who are thinking, oh, that that all sounds fantastic, but oh, I've just got COVID guidelines to deal with and I've got you know catch up to deal with and mental health issues to deal with and all, all of that you know my bubbles burst or you know I've got teachers off on you know uh, isolation why, why should they still be prioritizing music in, in that context um so, so Sophie I guess it'd be interesting to kind of get your take because your your head teacher is actually said no this is the year that we're going to work with Voices Foundation this is the year that we're really going to push music so what, what led you to that yeah um well we were we were already going to work with Voices Foundation and then Covid happened <laughs> and I think um I've kind of got almost two groups of people to speak to really that there's the leaders in the school and there are the, the, te the teachers of the 
the, the classroom, you know. Um, and I would say as a leader in school, it's about holding on to your, holding on to the vision. So our vision is we want as wide a possible curriculum, we want as wide a curriculum as possible. And one of the areas we wanted to grow and develop because we knew we already had the, a, a foundation in terms of an enthusiasm for musical learning, we held on to music. So whatever else is going on, COVID wise, government expectation wise for the core subjects, let's hold on to the fact that we're widening our curriculum and the key part of that widening is our music curriculum. So let's just try and find our way through and hold that clear and dear as leadership. Teachers, my message to our teachers is we've just started our training with you, haven't we, Voices Foundation? Um, message to teachers is just keep doing what you're doing. Yet we've got catch up, yet we've got a lot of juggling to do. We will make sure you've got the training you need and things are put in place safely for you to deliver our music curriculum. So the message to teachers is something exciting is coming. We're starting our training. We're going to hold your hand whilst we do it. But it has to come from the leadership and it has to come from the intent that you will hold on to it. I think without it being led and held clear and dear like all subjects like anything it could drop off mm -hmm. so that you have to be firm about your intent and what i say to our staff at, you know at our school is we know there's a load of covid stuff going on at the moment we're not going to ask you to do anything that's not safe we're taking our time but this is going to happen um so i think there, there, there are two there are two groups you need you need your leaders leading um and holding it clear and dear and you need your teachers being willing to okay we're waiting in the wings to, to get cracking with it and providing you put that framework if as long as you give teachers the skills they need and the freedom they need and the safe framework um they will do a blinking good job, but you just have to make sure you hold it very clear and sharp as, as a leadership team. Right, and, and Anita, from your, your perspective, um, you know, what, what, if you were trying to sort of persuade a, a more reluctant head teacher, so one that doesn't share Sophie's kind of clear clear vision, um, what, what case would you sort of put to them as to why they should sort of keep focusing on music education even even with all of the challenges? Well, that I think it's what's hidden, hidden in what you just said. It's like, even with all the challenges, let's keep doing music. And for me, it, it's not that way around at all. Mm -hmm. We've got students who are doing what you call catch up. We've had a similar sort of thing where we've had at home learning. So, and we know the kids learning speeds have slowed down because of that. And we've observed it across an entire state in Victoria. Um, and they're trying to catch up with everything just as your students are. So there's a during the time that they've just had, they've had a lot of pressure, which has actually slowed their learning down. Their well-being, we absolutely know, has been affected as well. Um, and that will impact on learning. But the one thing that can very, very quickly, incredibly cheaply, and very in a very accessible way, can reignite all of that so that their learning can return to the level it needs to, is by making music together. It synchronizes their brains together. It gets their brain all of the great, wonderful hormones and, and brain chemicals that they need going for their well-being to be bolstered. Is how it comes from singing together and it comes from making music together. That will then impact on their learning speeds, on their learning optimism, on their confidence in what they're doing, willingness to take risks, ability to get back to their logical thinking levels. It kind of a lot of the time we and we have it here too it's like we've got all this stuff to do but then music sits over here and that's an extra and I don't view it like that at all it's not an extra it's the thing that you can use as a tool to get these students as quickly and easily as possible back to their prime learning levels so that you can do good catch up because if you don't take care of that these kids are going to fall over. It doesn't matter where they are in the world. Mentally and cognitively, they're going to stumble because we haven't taken care of the foundations. And that's for me where the music can come in as a fantastic tool to help yeah. with back with those foundations again. And it's really quick and really easy. <laughs> so that would be my message um, about saying, don't think about it as something as extra or different. It's the foundation to getting these kids back to where they need to be. Can I add something to that, um, to Anita's point there, because I kind of saw this firsthand myself um, only last week when we had our initial um, some inset training for our, for, our, for our staff. 
it's so easy to forget as a professional, as, as Anita was saying, that the easy, simple things that you mm. can do within minutes in the classroom that switch brains on, that switch, mm. you know, connectivity, mm. you know, and with, with your voices or with a beat and just, you know, the Voices Foundation had us standing up, you know, counting out beats with our arms and our legs and the whole staff, you know, you had everybody laughing and then you had everybody and just it's small that can be really small steps it doesn't have to be an enormous oh gosh music curriculum mm. in, the, in covid times how are we going to do that it, it was just so refreshing to be reminded that it's it's so natural <laughs> um and actually it just you, you just need to be reminded sometimes but it's not your daily bread and butter yeah obviously voice manager we would, we would, would agree that i think that you know as you were saying that you know it, it it's one of the things that we've been talking to, you know, when we're talking to kind of new schools about, um, you know, coming on board with us this year is actually seeing it as a tool for rebuilding community. That, that the, you know, one of the things that you know, schools are struggling with is you know, children have been at home, um, you know, and dealing with everything that they've been they've been dealing with. But actually, um, you know, using kind of singing and music making as a way to kind of reconnect with the school community to help with you know behaviour challenges or um, you know all of that kind of thing is it's such a great way of kind of you know with saying earlier just kind of knitting knitting that community back together again so mm. um you know completely agree that it shouldn't be seen as a kind of an optional extra and a nice to have if you've got time but probably let's just focus on reading and writing um but actually it can kind of flow through everything and i think you know one of the things that you know, we've loved seeing so much with the programs that we've worked with over you know many many years has been where it starts to kind of bleed into every subject so you see yeah. Um, you know, music being used as a way to get focus at the beginning of a lesson or to kind of help with maths or, you know, when learning kind of you know, increasing vocabulary or, you know, whatever yeah. it might be, actually kind of start to see, you know, it's when, when the light bulb kind of goes on with, with teachers and with, you know, with school leaders are like, ah, as you were saying, Fabio, actually, this is something that is so easy, but can actually have benefit across, um, across the curriculum, across everything we're trying to achieve. It's not just something that should sit in a music lesson once a week, um, but it's actually something that can kind of filter through everything. I think that's, that, that's when it becomes really powerful as, a, as an agent for change. So yeah. Gary, I guess coming, coming to you from a kind of practical perspective, that, that all sounds great, but in reality, what can we do? You know, what, what do the guidelines tell us? What, 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 are, we, what are we allowed to do at the moment? Uh, well, the great thing about the lockdown is uh, certainly in terms of within the classroom um, and uh, in uh, most of the UK, nothing's changed. Uh, I know there's a prohibition in Scotland on singing, um, but um, across most of, it, most of uh, the UK, nothing's changed. You can still sing. There are false, uh, false rumours flying around about that. They are absolutely not true. Um, incidentally, actually, there's, there's no prohibition on any particular uh, instrument or mix of instruments uh, that, you can, uh, that you can do within the, um, uh, within the classroom. Um, in terms of what you've got to control for, it's water droplets. It's, that's how the, um, the disease is, uh, is, is, is spread. Uh, and they are spread in a, a range of sizes from um, very, very, very small down to absolutely minuscule. Those very smallest ones, those uh, will be entrained in an air current and will spread around the room. Um, and the larger ones will fall to the ground within two metres. Uh, and that's why we have the two metre or six feet social distancing uh, allowance. Um, in terms of singing within a bubble, um, within a class bubble, those children are exposed to each other all week. So in fact, that's where their risk resides. Um, actually, if you sing within that period, you're not going to be singing for great long lengths of time, probably. Lovely if you are, but uh, you're probably not. Um, so actually what you're not doing is multiplying that risk many fold because they're already at risk through that through that uh, exposure throughout the uh, throughout the week so the important things are actually i've got something i can share with you if i can get my mouse onto the right screen there you are that's just a, a little slide that i use which shows how um uh, how it how it transfers the really important thing is at the top there, that ventilation issue, because that's what's going to control the amount of aerosol in the room. Um, now that's going to get harder as we go into um, as we go into the um, uh, into the cold season, but you really do need to open a window and open the door, get some uh, fresh air flowing into that room. I would say keep your session lengths down and keep your um, range of volume down below about a mezzo piano so medium soft um, because that will control the amount of aerosol that's being produced 
The other thing is that we increase our water droplet production uh, with consonants. So if you're using um, if you're using sort of musical theatre levels of diction and really spitting out those P's and T's, then you really are putting a lot more water droplets into uh, into the room. So don't insist on on very clear diction for the minute. Um, you know, it's something you can work on later. Um, but that's going to control the amount of water droplets. Um, the other thing is this question of social distancing. Um, for singing, I do still recommend it if you can manage it and if you're singing for any amount of time. If you're doing a bit of incidental singing, uh, if you're singing a song about times tables and you're going to be doing that for two or three minutes, don't worry about it, you're fine. Um, but uh, if, if you've got a, a whole singing lesson, um, I'd say try and distance as much as the space will allow it. You might have a school hall that you can move into, but bear in mind that by moving around the uh, school and by using a shared space, you may be introducing uh, additional hazards. You may be better off staying in the room that you're in uh, and not being two metres apart. Uh, the other thing I'd think about is actually the singing leader. Um, the studies all show that children don't really pass it to each other um, and they don't that often pass it to adults, but adults pass it uh, between each other more easily than, than children do. So actually, if you've got a singing leader who's going from bubble to bubble, school to school, actually they're probably the person who's most at risk in that room. So make sure that they, or you as a singing leader, have got space. Dispose the children around the room so that you've got more space, ideally a good three metres between you and the nearest singer. And I think if you do all of that and keep the duration of your activity down, so if you if you don't sing for more than about 40 minutes and then can ventilate the room afterwards, so ideally sing before a break, then you're really doing everything you practically can within the classroom uh, to ensure that you're working safely. But I would underline that point that children don't easily pass it to themselves and they don't easily pass uh, the uh, infection to adults. So actually, do still sing it you can do it safely within the classroom you know it should still be part of what you do in the classroom i think you've probably all memorized that now so no wrong one there we are me again um um yes yeah, so do do still sing in the classroom because there's still lots that you can do and i would agree i, I think it's a false binary that um you know you you have to do the catch of stuff or you do music because you've got time uh, no, it absolutely ought to be there part and parcel and if you're doing incidental bits of singing uh, within the classroom particularly at uh, primary level I really wouldn't worry about that overly much right oh, sorry very, very reassuring and I guess the kind of following question is has anything changed as a result of the second lockdown in in England or is it, is it essentially the same because I know there were kind of worries about that from from schools Essentially, no. Um, uh, um, in England, the guidance to schools around music hasn't uh, changed all that dramatically, um, and the uh, the, the um, guidance for opening schools still says that you can sing in the classroom. Um, and in fact, uh, if we go back into the three-tier system, um, actually, it hasn't yet made any difference in any of the tiers. So, for example, when London went on uh, went on to tier two, we had a lot of schools phoning in. Not a lot of schools. We did have schools phoning in and saying, uh, "No, we can't have singing anymore." We had a lot of the Music Mark members uh, checking in with us. Mm -hmm. What's the position? No, it hasn't changed. And even in um, tier three, uh, so it's the very high risk areas um, where there is the possibility of additional local measures. Uh, singing in schools hasn't been one of them, or rather not singing in schools has not been one of them. Right. And, and you sort of touched on the, you know, the kind of risk in terms of adult transmission, but um, uh, in terms of, you know, obviously being, being kind of making sure the right kind of precautions are put in place, actually, you know, parapathetic teachers are allowed into schools, etc. They are. There are no um, there are no restrictions on peripatetic teachers, so they can teach in schools. They can teach children from different bubbles. Uh, they can actually move between bubbles, uh, and they can move between schools on the same day. There is there are no restrictions uh, in the guidance. Thank you. Um, so, kind of, I guess, considering all of that, um, you sort of touched on already, Sophie, that you were saying that it's not about sort of 
doing anything huge. It's just about kind of you know little things. But um, mm. you obviously started on your kind of journey with the, the Voice of Foundation this year. But you know what what do you kind of see as the as the kind of practical things that you can put in place? Um, you know that, that your teach, class teachers can, can do when it comes to singing. Well, it's it's really interesting, isn't it? Hearing different voices because hearing Gary's um uh, Gary's information there was just so reassuring. Even as head, so even so even as head, I've heard similar messages it's just really good to hear another person another professional <laughs> restate what 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 is safe and what and what the guidance could suggest and um so for example for us at the moment we, we aren't holding whole school assemblies we're holding remote assemblies mm -hmm. and one of the things i have been holding off on a little bit is us re-singing together restarting the singing a lot of the time through false messages you know it's, it's amazing at the moment when you're a, when you're a leader in school the amount of things you think you suddenly can't do mm -hmm. and then you when you track back <laughs> where's that come from you know you would be amazed the amount of things we suddenly think we can't do and actually when you track back that that there is no guidance guidance to say that is so um, and, it, and and singing is one of those uh, so one of the things that we're looking to do is how we safely start singing again um, and it was really interesting about the p's and the d's and the and the and the, the pronunciation yes. and everything like that um, so it's about us thinking about what we can do small steps so class assemblies and as classes singing within their within their classrooms and but singing all together when we have that, we're a whole group of meat. I think that's um, great. I love the sound of that. I mean, you, yeah, there is still a prohibition on large groups singing uh, because obviously you put large numbers of children and you're creating a lot of aerosol um, and it becomes very difficult to provide the, the right amount of ventilation. But the, you're, the way you're doing it, if you're, if you're having sort of simultaneous singing in classrooms, I think that's lovely. It's lovely. And it's a bit, thanks. And also the other thing you, I mean, I've kind of said this to a couple of members of staff, you actually can't stop children singing. They will sing <laughs> all of the time. I mean, uh, we're quite a musical school, as in teachers often have music on quite quiet in the classroom, depending on what's going on, the children are humming along. Or we have our maths program, it has an element of singing to it because we sing transition songs. But when the children go from carpet to table or table to something else, not that we are doing loads of moving, but try and stop the YFS from moving about, you know. Um, there's some, an element of singing happening there and it's just gonna be it's just so nice to be able to reassure teachers and look back and think what what singing do we do in school and can we still mm. and are there, and are there some things we could actually still be doing safely um following all the guidance etc so it's just yeah just heartening and just to kind of we've just got the, our big toe back in restarting the singing celebration side of life back at school but it's taken us a long time to get to the point where we're feeling confident enough to go for it um, that's great i'd say put a few more toes in um the um I, I, the, 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 again this was this has been touched on the idea of singing as being something that uh, that is very easy to use in transition moments uh, and, and actually very good for changing energy levels and, and for engaging children in the next uh, in the next process i'm really pleased to hear that's uh, that that's happening and i would absolutely say if you know, keep the yes keep the volume down don't over uh, don't over enunciate but still do that i wouldn't say that that's going to create uh, any great uh, concern um and i do wonder actually a lot of the time i think we've we've risk assessed a lot of these uh, a lot of these classroom activities around music into the ground uh, and I do wonder what's happening the rest of the week. So if you've got paired work with a piece of equipment for science, for example, I would suggest actually that the noise level and the, the, the risk of surface transmission from that piece of equipment is probably greater than a well-managed singing session. And yet I suspect that's not been risk assessed in the same way. So I would say absolutely carry on with your, with your transition singing. Sounds like a really good uh, plan to me. Brilliant, thank you. And it's interesting to hear, you know, has there been a different approach in Australia and in, in Victoria, has your experience been different or is, is the kind of government and schools sort of more open to singing or are you experiencing a similar kind of scaremongering? No, no there, there is no singing in Australian schools at the moment. Oh, wow. So, so we, yeah, um, it's, it's a huge bone of contention here in Australia because we've had, our states are allowed to set what well, we have federal guidelines that are put forward, our states have a control of what happens in the in the schools. Um, so they set the provisions and they have been wildly different. Um, so in New South Wales, even now, um, we still have a restriction on, for some reason, someone decided that, that flutes, clarinets, oboes, bassoons, saxophones couldn't be played because they would send out more droplets Whereas 
trumpets, trombones, tubers, they could all be played. And it's like, where are you no. getting your ideas no. from? No, exactly. Absolutely it, all of not. I think there's some really good research. I'm sure you're aware of what I tend to call the Colorado research. Um, uh, and, and that's that's really interesting in terms of all that. They looked at things as well. I and mean, I think there is still a problem around uh, the research that actually it, very nearly all looks at adults and very nearly all looks at professionals and I think children make music in a very different way but uh, you know actually I, I don't agree with that prohibition at all and actually if you were going to prohibit something it would make more sense to prohibit the uh, the brass instruments because the tests do show that they produce more water droplets. Yes so we had a lot of people doing videos online saying this is what comes out of a trumpet and this is what comes out of a mm, Yeah, the, yeah. The, <laughs> those drive me potty because of course yeah I don't uh, know how many times I've been told the air doesn't come out of a trumpet I don't know where people think it goes. <laughs> it does uh, come out of a trumpet. One, that was only one state and then the states outside took a totally different approach. Mm. So we've got this real really huge differences um, and of course Victoria's only just come out of 12 weeks of lockdown. So um, we've got these enormous differences across the country. Music educators, um, sort of choral specialists as well as instrumentalists are helping each other out with different ways of doing it. Yeah. But even here in Gary, the way that you describe what's possible, I mean, we're lucky in Australia because a lot of the time they're telling us we may go back to singing, but you only can do it outside. Now we're coming into our summer. So, mm. and that's possible thing to do in, in our sort of um, climate, but it's an incredibly difficult thing to do in, in the British climate. So yes. um, yeah, knowing, just hearing how you explained it is really amazing. And I wish more people in Australia could hear about this, the simple and yet very effective ways that they can continue singing. So that we're still, that's a really difficult thing for us in Australia. And um, we're returning to it in church groups, which seems strange because that's adults. And, but not necessarily yeah. in school. But we'll and get uh, actually, yes, yeah, so it is strange because there have been cases in America where church choirs have fallen sick, uh, um, uh, kind of en masse, because the ventilation actually often isn't as good in churches as, as it might be. Uh, although you have got a relatively large space for the uh, for the air to, uh, to to circulate in the mix in. Um, I mean, in terms of, of what you can do. Um, the music unlocked guidelines um, and there's also a set of questions to ask about ventilation in your space. They're on the Music Mark website. So although they do talk and they're very English and, and specifically English at the minute, um, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the recommendations are based on, on scientific studies from America and uh, Germany mainly. Um, but that's on the Music Mark website, which is musicmark.org.uk. Um, and, and obviously that's, that's written for COVID-19 and human beings, so it's going to be relevant wherever you are. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So it kind of leads us nicely into some of the questions that we've got coming through. So I think you just answered um, Ruth's question, Gary, which is where, where she could find the document that confirms that they're allowed to sing in the classroom. And she says that her school risk assessment doesn't allow this and she'd like to get them to change it. Um, yeah, so the other, the, the, the place to actually go to see what the guidance says is the DfE guidance full opening colon schools. Um, and there's a section there on music and uh, drama. And if you, if you head down to that, it does say, yes, you may sing. Great. But that you do have to be, there are things in that, that guidance that says you can do this. And there are things in there that are allowed by virtue of not being mentioned. So right. people sometimes say to me, say, well, where can I see it written down that it says this? So say, well, it doesn't, it just doesn't say that you can't, <laughs> but it does say you can sing. Great, thank you. Um, so just to, to let people, I think we've got a couple of questions coming through the chat bar. If people can put them into the Q&A box, that would be helpful. I think it helps us to manage those. Um, so just uh, moving on down to a question, um, which should be an easy one to answer from, from Malcolm. So uh, this is to Gary. So are you saying we can sing um, with whole classes up to 30 together? Yes. As Sophie says, as leaders, we're hearing different things from different sources. And I heard that we need to keep singing to groups of 15. However, I've also seen guidance that says small groups are okay. Yeah, okay. So. Um... The 15 figure came from the guidance that was published uh, the bank holiday weekend in August, if you remember um, having sat and read 18,000 words of guidance uh, one day, then uh, it was all updated on the Friday night before schools went back. Um, that was where the 15 appeared. It was dropped from a later version of the guidance. I couldn't, uh, early October, I think. Um, 
So um, while, it, again, it's one of these things where it didn't explicitly say in words of one syllable, yes, you may sing in whole class groups, um, the 15 disappeared in favour of um, a provision on ventilation, um, which is, I don't know, I have a slight problem with the provision of ventilation and I don't think it's actually possible and I think it's uh, it's in, in most schools and, and, and it's excessive, uh, which is why um, there's a set of questions to ask about ventilation on the Music Mark website. Um, I should say that's the only place in which I diverge dramatically from the DfE guidance, but I don't think I do so unsafely. Um, the guidance says small groups are okay. Um, this comes down to the difference between class bubbles and out of class groups. So there is still, a, or, well, before lockdown, there was still a prohibition uh, or, or a, a very, very strong guideline on 15 being the maximum. So if you were doing after school singing or lunchtime singing, um, and that's because those groups potentially drawing from multiple bubbles. So uh, by having groups of 15, you're, you're reducing the additional exposures that children have. Um, and by keeping those groups small and consistent throughout um, the term or throughout the year, um, you're reducing the number of um, the number of contacts. But yes, absolutely, a class can sing altogether. Um, the, but you know, just bear in mind, you will need to ventilate the room and you, you, you know, if you can distance, then I still advise it. Right. And I think you just answered Laura's question there, which was around choir. So she just asked, um, but her understanding was that choir of up to 15 is okay from different bubbles as long as it's the same children. So you're saying That's yes. Correct. That's yeah. correct, yeah. Although at the minute, um, at the minute, there's a bit of a... Um, uh, there's a bit of debate about what the guidance actually says about after school choirs um, uh, during the lockdown. But yeah, um, Laura's understood it exactly right, for, certainly for when we go back into uh, normal. No, no, not normal. When, when, when the lockdown ends. <laughs> um, and just to say, my colleagues um, posted the, the links that you've just referenced in the chat. So if anyone wanted Lovely. to look around those, those um, guidelines are, are in the chat box. Um, so a question now from, from John Patton, who says he's not a school teacher, but a school governor and musician. <clears throat> Um, and can, uh, can do musical things in school and um, says the head is anxious about singing and I don't think much of that's going to happen anytime soon um, but he's interested in doing work with rhythm which is mm. a weak spot for some of the children and um, do you have any uh, suggestions on, on doing sort of rhythm work um, so yeah, yeah. Let's, let's talk, all on any of you um, you know what body percussion body percussion easy um, and uh, no uh, no no um, uh, equipment required, um, body percussion. But I mean, to be honest, if you're using anything that doesn't raise um, aerosol levels, so if you're using drums and percussion, um, then you're not increasing the aerosol. There's a surface contact uh, transmission risk, what we call fomite risk, um, which is my favourite word of the season. Um, but um, uh, there's been a study recently that suggested that even fomite risk isn't as great as they uh, as, as was originally suggested. As I said, just put something up about brooms, chair drumming, through the buckets. One um, East, uh, no West London hub um, has actually persuaded their local branch of B and Q to give them two thousand plastic buckets for drumming. Wow. Fantastic. And then Sophie, you were kind of referencing when we, when we had our kind of inset session, we were doing some, some kind of, you know, movement, you know, kind of counting things out, with, you know, with, with, with our bodies. So um, I guess you, you'd be an advocate for that sort of thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Anything with a beat, anything that just, it, yeah, anything with a beat. And it, it's just extraordinary how simple it could be. Um, and it's just remembering that, you know, of course, singing, singing is something special, isn't it? But if you're not singing, there are all kinds of other musical things that you can do. Um, it's just about do what we've done and just get involved with people that really know what they're talking about and then do what they say. <laughs> That's what I say to schools. It's just, there is the information out there. There are experts. And I think school leaders, teachers, school leaders, we're all expecting ourselves to be experts in a time of something that's never happened to the world before. Yeah. And um, we aren't, but there are people out there that are experts about other things like singing, like music, you know, mm. you, it's a, to reach out, reach out to the people that know and use it as support. I think heads and school leaders at the moment are, are expecting, are expecting themselves to have all the answers and we, we don't. <laughs> um, so work as a team, reach out to people, I would say. And if you know what you want to happen in your school or your classroom, but, you know, obviously I'm not advocating teachers going against what their school leadership say and what their academy trusts and everything say, anything like that, of course not. But um, if you've got an idea about what you want to happen musically in your school or your class or your little space, whatever it is you're running, think about it carefully, get the right guidance from the right people, think some more, 
but go, but go for it in a safe way because there are all kinds of things that could be happening that aren't um so my my yeah my kind of sentence is just find out from people that do know you don't have to have all the answers yourselves mm -hmm. And no. your experience, what, what, you know, other than singing, if people want to do music making in other ways, what would you be recommending right now? Oh, absolutely. The next one would be anything that is percussive or beat keeping. Rhythm making, again, I always go back to, from tribally, we would get around a fire and we would create beats and rhythms. And that that is the next most powerful co social cohesive experience that mm. we can have as humans. Um, just keeping a beat together makes us feel like a group immediately. It takes a minute and we suddenly feel like we're, we're a group together and we're doing something together. And that, that it, it stays for days, that sort of feeling, that enormous reward network hit that we get. And the other part of it is flipping it around. If, um, so drum, drum work, uh, beat keeping, rhythm making, stuff that we do together is used very, very heavily in um, helping people who've experienced trauma because it helps rewire their brains extremely quickly to, to stop being in a fear state and return to a calm and a learning state. Now, we're not positive what COVID's done in terms of uh, to our students' brains and to how they're actually functioning, but using something that's absolutely not going to hurt and could be incredibly um, beneficial from a trauma point of view to get them back into their learning could be great as well. So drum circles, you know, even just clapping a beat together when you come into the room together. Um, I love lining up my sort of 10-year-old kids and going, okay, we're going to share a beat all the way down the line. And we're going to keep going. If someone misses it, we're going to go back to the beginning again. There's nothing better to create teamwork in a whole class than actually getting them to do an activity where every single child is equal mm -hmm. and every single child has an important job to do. And keeping a beat all the way down is the best. And it's a game and they love it and it's a great thing to do. So having music, as Sophie sort of talked about with her school, having music happening incidentally, formally and informally, you know, that's the most that's the most powerful thing of having a music, a musically infused school that can help the students with their learning. Amazing. Um, a question just come through for, for you, Anita, is if someone who's been really fascinated by the um, information you've been sharing, can you tell us a bit more about your book? So if they were to pick up the music advantage, what else could they kind of learn about the fascinating world of neuroscience <laughs> music? <laughs> Uh, there's a huge amount. I I sort of, um, I look from zero, from when babies are born up to when they're adults. I don't necessarily say that's 18, but um, it's sort of through the whole, whole part of their um, education, their first education, basically. And I tell lots of stories that any teacher or any parent would recognise. And then I kind of infuse all the research in anything to do with language, um, something called uh, inhibitory control which is self-regulation how do we learn how to regulate our own emotions how do we learn how to be leaders when we're um, through the music learning experience um, how do we learn how to value diversity and value the other and value the different and actually search out for the different which I think in in um, definitely our, our first world countries are a very difficult thing to do often where we're not as good at valuing something that's different we like you know, the norm and the same, which is everything about this year has challenged that. So it's all about, it's all about stories and you'll recognise things in there. There's a lot of humour in there, um, but also it's about presenting the research in such a way that it makes sense in what you're going to see in your classroom the next day or what you're going to see with your own child as they're, they're learning music or as I've had lots of messages from people, what they experienced themselves in their own childhood and it kind of explains why things happened in a certain kind of way. So it's been really lovely to share all that story, all those stories, but also all the research in a way that everyone can kind of grab hold of what's good, what what they want to know. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, I think we're, we're just uh, coming to time now, and I think we've, we've answered everyone's questions, I think, which is good. We're good, good, good going. Um, so thank you all to, uh, so much for, for joining us. So thanks to all our attendees, and a huge, huge thank you to the panellists. Um, I think everyone will agree that's been a really fascinating discussion, a kind of journey through kind of music from our tribal days around the fire to, uh, to the present day and making music in COVID. It's quite, we've run quite the gamut of topics there. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for, for joining in that conversation. Um, uh, you know, please please continue the, the discussion online and say using the hashtag VFSingWell. Um, 
we'll be um, posting this video on, on YouTube in the next couple of days. Um, and the, the Voices Foundation, we're so passionate about singing and music making for all of the reasons that we've been discussing today. Um, we know that it's a very challenging time, that the educators are, are facing a lot of pressure, um, but we're here to help. Um, so we hope that this session today has been useful. Um, please do check out our website, voices.org.uk, for, for more information, more resources. Um, and if you think that we could help uh, you or your school, um, please, please do drop us a line um, and look out for more of these sessions in the future. Thanks so much, everyone.